This is Outbreak News This Week, brought to you by the Global Dispatch Incorporated. Outbreak News This Week is your source for all the news about worms and germs. And now, your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com. Here's Robert Harriman. Well, good evening, Tampa Bay and everyone listening online. I appreciate you listening tonight. It's going to be a really good show, and you're really going to enjoy it. And I also encourage you to check out the website, OutbreakNewsToday.com, OutbreakNewsToday.com. A lot of things happening there. We see some Powassan virus up in Maine. Uh, the norovirus outbreak in Yolo County, California is top 4,000 cases um, for the month of May. So that and a whole bunch of other stories um, are found on the website, OutbreakNewsToday.com. Now, everything in life carries some risk. Yeah, and this includes being an inpatient in a hospital or a patient in some other type of healthcare setting. And there's a number of risks associated with hospitals and healthcare settings. And, and one is acquiring infections. Because hospitals, they're really loaded with a lot of nasty bugs. Um, and a lot of times you go there expecting to get better, but some actually wind up getting worse while in the hospital. So joining me now to discuss the large and important topic of healthcare associated infections or HAIs is Rodney Rohde, PhD. Dr. Rohde is the chair and professor of clinical laboratory science and the associate dean for research at the College of Health Professions at Texas State University. And Dr. Rohde also does quite a bit of research on one of our main topics today, MRSA. Dr. Rohde, welcome back to the show, sir. I appreciate it. Thanks so much, Robert. It's always a pleasure to join you. Excellent. All right. Well, let's go ahead and start out with some basic definitions. And uh, what is a health-associated infection, healthcare-associated infection? It, is it restricted to hospitals? Robert, HAIs, as, as the acronym is stated, healthcare-associated infections, have been around for quite a while. Actually, some of the first ones we were seeing were actually decades ago now. But they're really those infections that patients will get while usually receiving treatment. And it's usually for some medical or surgi surgical condition. And unfortunately, some of these HAIs are preventable. So that's something we'll talk about later, I'm sure. And it's not just restricted to hospitals. Um, in fact, it used to be known as a hospital-acquired infection. And, and the acronyms kind of changed to be more encompassing because really any healthcare facility can be a reservoir. Uh, for example, a nursing home or perhaps a dialysis clinic could also be the a reservoir for those types of infections. Right. Now, let, let's talk about some numbers because I'm a numbers guy. Um, how big of a problem is HAIs in the United States? How many infections and deaths and uh, so on? It's actually pretty scary when you start looking at the numbers. And as you know, this is a, a passion for me, and I typically can get on a soapbox about this. But if you look at... The data, if you look at the, the peer-reviewed data, there's a range. So if you're kind of looking at acute uh, care hospitals in the United States, the numbers start out around 720,000 HAIs per year, but they can go as high as 2 million when you talk about the entire health care um, spectrum. So somewhere in that range, depending on what you're looking at, and then if you're talking about deaths, uh, which is obviously the worst outcome of these, uh, anywhere from around 75,000 to up to about 90,000 are estimated to die each year due to healthcare associated infections. And really, um, what is kind of important to keep in mind, and this is my own opinion, but, but many of my colleagues feel this way too, is because sometimes the death certificates in hospitals will, um, just often have, even the electronic health record will often have the, the last event of someone passing away, uh, for instance, uh, a heart attack or some type of cardiac event, where in reality it may have started with, with a surgical site wound that became septic and then that person succumbed to a heart attack. It's really hard to know the actual number. So I think the estimates are underestimated in my own opinion. Okay. And we're talking infections, and infections can be in all different parts of the body. Um, 
what are the most common types of HAI um, infections that are um, acquired? Sure. So there's all sorts, obviously, but I'll give you like the top five um, because those are probably the most common. And remember about one in 25 hospital patients can pick one of these up on any given day. So that's another number to kind of think about. Um, the first is typically known as a catheter-associated urinary tract infection. We sometimes call those in the, in the trenches a cauti. And that, for the general public out there, is just when you have a catheter inserted for some type of, of urinary tract infection. Another type is a surgical site infection, an SSI, some type of infection at the site of, a, of an incision, for instance. And then bloodstream infections. Fourth is pneumonia. And then the fifth type has anything to do with a organism, a bacterium called Clostridium difficile. Those are typically... Um, associated with something called antibiotic-associated diarrhea, where you're given antibiotics and you stay on them so long that you actually wipe out the good intestinal bacteria and you cause diarrhea. So we can talk a little bit more about Clostridium later, but those are the typical top rankers. Right, and, and did you put that in order? So the, the I did, yeah. yeah, and that's from one of the more recent um, CDC publications. So I went and tried to find those top five for us to talk about. Excellent. All right, now... As you kind of alluded to, um, uh, HAIs are often involved um, uh, because of invasive procedures. What are some of the procedures um, that carry the most risk for HAIs? Again, there's quite a few. Um, there are risk factors in, in healthcare. We often talk about risk factors. We also talk about risk factors in public health. So those things that can lead to an infection in this case. Typically, for HAIs, they're grouped into three general categories, and the one you've asked me about is kind of in the medical procedures area. Uh, that's also sometimes lumped in with antibiotic use. The other two that we may not spend as much time today talking about today is organizational issues around the healthcare setting, and then finally, patient being a person, a patient characteristic, so their behavior. And then even the, even the behavior of the healthcare provider, uh, for instance, hand hygiene between different areas of the hospital. So all of those can influence the rate of an HAI. But some of the procedures, um, we all know that modern healthcare has, you know, an amazing and diverse set of, of procedures and invasive devices that they can use to treat patients and really help them recover. But, you know, things like catheters, which is what most people understand, or maybe a ventilator, so people can get ventilator-associated pneumonia when you basically need help breathing. And then any type of scope where they're going in and they're scoping your internal abdomen or your internal organs to look mm -hmm. for certain types of issues are probably what most people in the public would understand. So, And there's a whole conversation about that, Robert, around, you know, can those things be sterilized properly and can those things be utilized in a way that are um, of value. So that's another conversation perhaps, but that is a concern when you talk about healthcare associated infections. Sure. And we just saw, I don't know, a year or so ago, the outbreak right. with the endoscopes. Exactly. Right. Exactly. A really scary and kind of problematic issue with endoscopes. Sure. Let me, let me piggyback on a couple of things you said, Dr. Rohde, Um because I'd love to hear your answers. When you mentioned organizational issues and patient behavior, um, can you uh, uh, talk about those uh, briefly? Sure. Well, first of all, the um, I think the patient characteristics, I'll start there. Okay. If you just think about your own behavior as a patient, um, for instance, and we've talked about this on, on another show we did with you, um, just not taking your antibiotics for the full term mm -hmm. uh, or maybe borrowing antibiotics from a friend and taking the wrong type. So you're taking a drug that is not properly vetted for the organism that is infecting you. That creates all sorts of problems sure. down the road. Um, and even simple things that we all know about, like hand hygiene, you know, within a, within a healthcare setting where you might be a carrier of a particular organism and you are passing that along to other patients or to your family members. So just personal behavioral kind of characteristics. Mm -hmm. And then organizational is a little, I think, bigger kind of 
of scheme to think about, but one in which maybe, say, uh, working between a pharmacy within a hospital and the medical laboratory and even the physician. So you really have three entities there that are kind of siloed. Sometimes we're trying to get better at this, but the maybe the inability to come up with best practices between the diagnosis and relaying information correctly to a physician who then understands the exact drug to utilize, and really the pharmacy coming in sometimes and saying, hey, current best evidence shows us that what you thought was the best drug is no longer true. It literally has changed in real time in the last month. And so those are the types of organizational factors that we're trying to get better at. Excellent. I'm glad we touched on that, uh, particularly the patient behavior part for for the audience. Um, sure. It's uh, sometimes very... Because different. really the patient is is got a huge, you know, piece of this and helping make it better. So it's not just on the side of healthcare. It's, it's all of us. Right. Right. Okay. Let's uh, switch gears to the actual microbes and the microbes that are most responsible are the things that many in the public have heard of before. And antibiotic resistance is often a major issue with many of these organisms. Um, Dr. Rohde, what are the most common and the most troubling infections found in HAIs? There are many, <laughs> unfortunately. Right. I actually I actually have another publication that I keep on my desktop here in, in my office because I'm often thinking about this and looking at it and being asked this question. And and there's a ranking that goes up to 15 or 20, but I'll give you the first three or four, and then I'll, I'll spout out some other ones that people in the public may have heard of. The number one ranked organism with respect to the, the types of infections they cause across all spectrums is Staphylococcus aureus. By far, that ranks number one still. The second on the list is an organism that many people may have heard of called uh, Escherichia coli, sometimes called E. coli. It's a common uh, fecal organism. It's actually normal flora, but it can become dangerous depending on the, the type. Klebsiella, which has been in the news recently, um, it's one that's shown up in, in Houston and in China and in really lots of places that, that has some troubling resistance issues with it. Uh, Pseudomonas is one that is associated with cystic fibrosis and burn victims. It creates a really nasty biofilm, so it's hard to remove from surfaces many times. And then I'll just throw another one out here that folks may have heard of, uh, Candida albicans and Candida auris, which is a yeast, actually. It's not a bacterial right. agent, but it's actually number seven on the list, and it's, wow. kind, of, it's kind of growing. And I, I know you know about it a little bit, and it's one we're worried about because it's a fungal agent, which is eukaryotic, like human cells. So it's sometimes difficult to treat these types of yeast infections or fungal infections because the drugs can uh, work against your own cells because we're kind of alike. Sure. We're both eukaryotic. Right. Now, now the, the list of microbes that you gave me, um, they pretty much all have a possible common characteristic of big-time antibiotic resistance. Correct. Every single one of them, and that just makes it that much more difficult. Absolutely. Um, let's go ahead and talk MRSA, uh, methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Um, this is something you know pretty well inside and out. Um, for the audience, Dr. Rohde, what is Staphylococcus aureus and what is MRSA? I think most people in the general public would understand if we started with a staph infection. So let's just, well, I think everybody's heard of that. Okay. It's usually associated with a skin infection. But when you talk about bacteria, I'm going I'm to back it up to the basics here. It is a genus and a species that we typically talk about, and Staphylococcus is the genus here. It's a, it's a very common, what we call gram-positive bacterium. Gram-positive just means how we stain it, and we can put it into a pot so we know what it is. And there are many species. Uh, two that we really spend a lot of time talking about with respect to, to HAIs are Staphylococcus aureus, which is one we're going to spend more time on. And then there's another one called Staphylococcus epidermidis. Both of these species are common 
skin flora, meaning that they can survive on you and in you for quite some time. And many times, they do not cause an infection. This is called being colonized, and this is an important distinction. It means you can have it on you. In fact, we have lots of bacteria on us and in us that might be good. But when they enter into uh, sites that they shouldn't be in, like a cut, or if we uh, take our finger and scratch something and put it in our eye or, or touch an infant or anything like that, we can we can introduce these organisms into sterile sites or sites that are going to come a problem for those folks. Staph aureus is the primary pathogen, the primary disease causer in this genus. And it's been kind of a problem over the years. It's what I call the garden variety of the Staphylococcus. So when you hear a physician tell you or somebody, a dermatologist, say something about a staph infection, it could very well be just normal staph aureus that you can actually treat. Or you may not even need to treat. You might be able to clean it and watch it and and do something called an, an incision and drainage, and it and it goes away. But as, as recently as the 1940s, uh, we began seeing resistance in this particular uh, species, Staphylococcus aureus, and it became known as methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, as many people are aware of, MRSA, MRSA. And what that means is it's basically um, resistant to a, a variety of beta-lactams, which is a full class of certain types of antibiotics. And so that resistance continues to grow. Now, um, so antibiotics like um, what our grandparents like took, penicillin, like just do not work anymore. On the they can work, you know, at certain percentages. Mm-hmm. And again, we'll we'll bring this up in a little bit on your on some follow-up questions probably, but with respect to when you get diagnosed, and that's why it's so important because some antibiotics do still work. Mm-hmm. It kind of depends on literally the strain, which is kind of a, a level below the genus and species, and what that particular bug is resistant to. So you almost always need a, a culture to figure out the organism, and then you need a, an antibiotic susceptibility test to determine which drugs are going to be the most effective. Now, with MRSA infections, because MRSA, as you said, is a colonizer, it's kind of ubiquitous. Um, It is. So anytime you break the skin, you're at risk, obviously. Um, What other infections is it implicated in? Are there MRSA pneumonias? There are. uh, Even staph. So, again, I'm going to kind of break these in two for the audience, but just regular staph that's not actually full-on resistant and MRSA, so both types that you might see in the healthcare setting or the community setting, they can cause all sorts of, of problems, uh, ranging from kind of what we might call a simple skin infection to sepsis, which is bloodstream involvement, to pneumonia, and you know all the way to death if it if it gets to be that problematic. Um, and when you mention colonization, one quick thing to mention to the audience is that. This particular organism, typically about 30% of us carry or are colonized by Staphylococcus aureus on our skin, and probably somewhere in the realm of 1% to 3% of us will carry it in our anterior nares of our nose. And what's interesting, Robert, in my studies, and I've been, I've been working with this organism as far as research goes for probably pushing 15 years now. I have done so many studies in different populations between prisoners, college students, physical therapy students, nursing students, the general public. I mean, it just kind of goes on and on. And even in my own classrooms, I'll do this to make a point sometimes. If if you walked into a room that me and you were in and there were, you know, 100 people and we swabbed everybody's nose or their skin surface – it is really bizarre because it always comes out in somewhere in the realm of about 25 to 35%. It's just in that 30% range that most people carry this around, So, which is probably why it's such a problem. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Um, so how is, how is MRSA diagnosed? MRSA is diagnosed just like most all other bacterial infections. From a physician standpoint, 
they often, or even yourself, so even in the public this might happen. Many of us sometimes are, are dealing with a, if you're talking about a skin infection, uh, which is a lot of the MRSA types infections when they start in the community, they're often mistaken for a, an actual spider bite. There's a little red bite that can itch and it can show a pimple hit on it. And if it's truly MRSA and it and it worse, gets worse as time goes on, it can get very painful and hot to the touch and and get really painful. That's one of the big differences between a regular staph infection and a MRSA infection, that it gets really, really painful. But as far as the diagnosis goes from a laboratory standpoint, those specimens get submitted to the laboratory, the medical laboratory for culture, which means you're growing it up in different types of, of media. That's how bacteria grow. And you're doing a variety of testing to see what it is. Is it Staphylococcus aureus? Is it Staphylococcus epidermidis? Is it a cousin like Streptococcus that causes strep throat? And so on and so forth. And then once you identify that particular organism, the very next test, which I, I get on a soapbox about uh, to the public, that is just as important, and that is the antibiotic susceptibility test, is, an, is a test that will take that organism you just identified and test it across a panel of dozens of antibiotics to let you know which antibiotic or antibiotics are the most useful to kill that bug. And so those two tests together are really important that they're done. And then in the, in the world of rapid testing, um, so those are kind of the gold standards that we always do in the medical laboratory, but certainly there are some amazing new rapid uh, molecular based on DNA or RNA types of tests that can do these things very quickly, sometimes within 30 minutes. But that, that culture and susceptibility tests are still the gold standard as of today. But we might one day move to even more rapid testing. Sure, and that, and that no doubt would benefit the patient. To, Absolutely. As far as the treatment. Time, time is life, That's right. <laughs> not always money. Okay, Rodney, i got about um, two minutes left. And uh, uh, I, I remember years ago, um, MRSA was an issue more or less restricted to the hospital setting, but that's not the case anymore, is it? It really isn't. It's, In fact, I would sometimes say the community has become even more important because it's such a high um, reservoir of people not really paying as much attention to maybe hygiene. So, I mean, I just mentioned some of those studies, but anytime you have a, a person or people in activities or places that involve crowding, you know, and skin-to-skin contact or shared equipment, so you think about athletics, you think about daycares and school students, military personnel, or even those that have just received medical care and they're coming back out into their family settings. Those are worrisome with respect to getting these through the community setting. Yeah, and, and more often than not, I mean, you hear more and more stories of professional athletes picking Absolutely. it up, uh, wrestlers, football players. Ex- exactly. In fact, Unfortunately, it seems sometimes that's that's what helps us promote education is that you see a star or an athlete or somebody else that's you know lost a leg or you know some horrible story about this this dangerous topic when in reality it's happening to neighbors and friends and people you just don't really know about sometimes yeah okay, I got about a minute left um let's go ahead and let me ask you real quick and see if you can um Give me a quick answer on this. Vancomycin, this is an antibiotic that uh, many people are familiar with. Um, it's frequently used to treat MRSA infections. However, there are some Staphylococcus aureus infections that are resistant to vancomycin. Uh, Dr. Rohde, in about 30 seconds, how common is this and how are they treated? Actually, Robert, it's it's actually, in the U.S., it is still pretty uncommon. Um, we're not seeing... We're not seeing, as of my knowledge of looking at most uh, data, what's called VRSA, vancomycin-resistant. We are seeing some vancomycin intermediate, which is called VISA. Uh, But right now, we believe that um, most of those types of isolates of bacteria are still somewhat susceptible to many of the FDA-approved drugs. But it's certainly on the horizon, and we have seen it in other countries. All right. Excellent. All right. After the break, we'll be talking more about healthcare associated infections with Dr. Rodney Rohde. Come right back for that. <laughs> 
Welcome back to Outbreak News This Week, your source for all the news about worms and germs. Here's your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Well, welcome back to the program. Um, today we're talking about healthcare associated infections or HAIs. And my special guest today is an expert. And his name is Rodney Rohde, PhD. Um, Dr. Rohde is a professor at Texas State University. And Dr. Rohde, let's switch gears to C. diff, Clostridium difficile. Something uh, I would say a lot of uh, people that have dealt with hospitals may have heard about this. Um, What is it and how common is C. diff? Clostridium difficile is a a nasty, nasty bug. It's a gram positive, just like MRSA, but this one's anaerobic, which means it it can actually thrive in non-oxygenated environments. And probably what's most difficult about it, Robert, is it produces something called an endospore. And endospores for the public are things that these bacteria can produce, and they basically are a way to survive. So they, if if you're trying to kill the parent, the par- the parent, Clostridium difficile, it can produce a spore, and it's basically, it's just kind of a way to go dormant in the environment. And those spores can get moved around and, and become a problem with transmission in all sorts of environments. But what's really bizarre with this one, um, although I guess it's not bizarre, it's kind of like Staphylococcus aureus in a way, but this one's a common bacterium of the human intestinal environment, uh, sometimes in about 2 to 5% of patients. So if you are exposed to antibiotic therapy for a long time or, you know, you're just in the hospital or maybe a long-term care facility for a long time, you're you're at extended risk. Or if you're immunosuppressant or, or you're an elderly person. So all those types of things can be a risk factor. And again, basically what happens if it's you and you're on antibiotic therapy for a long time is you wipe out the good bacteria and that typically competes and keeps those bad bacteria from taking over. And so if you wipe those good ones out, uh, C. diff can overtake you and, and cause all sorts of problems. With respect to the environment, that spore can be a problem uh, for sterilization and cleaning and processing of rooms because you may have certain types of things that will kill the, uh, the parent that's living, the Clostridium difficile parent, but those spores are just durable and can survive all sorts of detergents and procedures. And so you really have to have a educated and kind of a professional hygiene specialist, environmental services personnel that can take care of that room in the proper way by processing it and choosing the correct types of agents to kill those particular organisms. And how common is C. diff? Dr. Rooney, C. diff infection. Um, it is on the list of bugs we talked about earlier. It typically is in the top ten. It kind of bounces around, but percentage-wise, it it kind of depends on the actual population you're looking at. So it's kind of hard to to put a number on. Okay. If you're looking in the in the, um, for instance, the long-term care facilities. It approaches 40, 50 percent because they are always, or I shouldn't say always, many of them are on antibiotics a lot, and mm-hmm. so they tend to have a higher percentage. And and the severity of a C. diff infection in some of these elderly patients is quite devastating. It is it quite be. devastating. Yeah. Um, you know, if you look at it across one year, I can give you some numbers for that. I mean, mm-hmm. if you look across it one year. There's about a half a million infections and about 29,000 deaths in any given year. So in, 20, in 2011, it was the 17th ranked leading cause of death for people 65 and older. And it causes something the public might hear about this. It's often called CDI, Clostridium difficile infection. So a lot of physicians and others will just refer to it as CDI. And then it reoccurs in about one in five patients. So it's it's one of those things, if you get it once, sometimes it can come back on you, you know, 20% of the time. So it's it's problematic for sure. Yeah. And it's not really so much the, the bacterium itself, it's the toxin that's produced. Absolutely. Yeah, I was going to mention that too. So C. diff, once it's in you, and it actually leads to problems with diagnosis because you can show C. diff in a person because it can be normal flora. Right. 
but it's not producing the toxin, so the person's fine. So there's actually, with this particular bug, when you do a diagnostic test, you're looking for uh, a toxin assay so that you can make sure it's the actual bug you're, you're targeting. Um, so what are the symptoms of C. diff infection, CDI? There are a number of symptoms. Probably the most common and most well-known is watery diarrhea, sometimes called Clostridium difficile-associated diarrhea, fever, nausea, um, obviously abdominal cramping, and then if you're not watching what's going on, major dehydration issues can occur, and then appetite issues and things like that. But that that diarrheal illness is the hallmark for this particular infection. And, I mean, the patient wouldn't know this, but the physician could look, and there's something called a pseudomembranous colitis. Yes, yes, and that's that is along that that toxin, that intoxication of the intestinal area. And if you're doing a scope that we talked about earlier, sometimes you can see the um, oh, what are they, the lesions, mm-hmm. you know, along the intestinal tract that can that can uh, be seen with that type of procedure from a physician. Okay, and this and this is a big can be a very big issue in hospitals. Um, and I'll use a hospital as an example. Um, it, it's easily it could be easy because it's hard to kill, like you said. It really is. It could be easily spread from healthcare worker to patient to healthcare worker to patient. Um, it, right? I mean, it's easy, pretty easy to spread in the environment. It really is. Yeah. I mean, there is so much in this area that we could talk about. I mean, some of the – you kind of hit on several on your own. Some of the, the risk factors. I mean, here's a stat that might scare you. Admission to the hospital for more than eight hours, especially for coming through an ER, is a risk factor for – picking up clostridium because it's just so prevalent. Certainly, if you're in a nursing home, that's a high risk factor. If you are getting gastrointestinal surgery or having procedures, you know, in that area of your body, that's a risk factor. So all of those, and then it's trumped with if you take, you know, antibiotics for long term, um, those all just, just push that rate up. And then as you mentioned, healthcare workers, and so this is something I harp on with my students and my colleagues and across the allied health spectrum, you know, hand hygiene and how you handle yourself is a moment-by-moment critical, important event because those spores uh, from C. difficile, if they're the environment, you know, um, whether it's from touching something in the room on the surface and then you go to a different room, that can be very problematic. There's even studies, Robert, that show flushing toilets, for instance, in a healthcare environment can cause the the outward push of some of these spores because they are very minute and microscopic and can be moved around by wind currents. Hmm. Interesting. Um, yeah, it, it is interesting. Not to not to harp on it, but some would say that it's it's critical that we have toilets that have lids on them. But the next time you're in a hospital, look around. Many of them don't. So it makes common sense, but sometimes, you know, it just takes a while for the science to catch up to the to the act of doing something like that. So that's that's another area. If you get into the environmental services area and the cleaning industry, the sterilization of products and rooms and, and, de- and processing of areas, that's really important. Well, you've ta- you're talking about cleaning and processing of rooms. Uh, clearly, C. diff has to be treated differently than, say, uh, a Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, because of the spore. So prevention of C. diff is the use of a sporicidal agent. Uh, right. And one of right. the, and one I, of the methods. You're right. So sporicidals, you're going to have to think about those and I'm not, this is not my expertise, but certainly sporicidals are going to be taken into account. Um, using a certain type of processing of different areas so that you know, you're not, you know, because if you don't have a spore side and you're taking cleaning instruments, you know, a mop or a different type of, of towel or something like that, and you're cleaning, even if you're using a, a solid um, disinfectant or something that you typically might use for a different organism, you might kill C. diff the parent, but you may not kill C. diff the spore. And so you can transport that across the floor, you know, across different areas of rooms if you're moving that that uh, cleaning device from one place to the other. 
Yeah, but some people even think we should just go to you know one use and done. But you know that's a that's a conversation for economics and things like that. Exactly, but that's a lot of dollars and cents there. It is. It is. Um, uh, how is C diff diagnosed and treated? The diagnosis is a little different. Um, while you can culture it, which we talked about earlier, I mean, I can grow it up. There's special media that allows you to grow C. difficile. Really, the primary means is a more rapid um, bacterial toxin assay. So typically, you're looking at stool samples, uh, whatever whatever type of sample you're getting from a patient, and you're doing a, a toxin test. Um, there's also some molecular tests that I mentioned earlier now that are that are kind of growing in popularity, which is a little more rapid. So those are the primary ways. A physician, again, if they're doing an endoscope or doing some type of of scope of different parts of your body, they may see those lesions we talked about and and kind of diagnose from a symptomology standpoint early before they follow up with an assay in the lab. As far as treatment goes, um, you've mentioned one of these. Um, Vancomycin is one that's often used. Sometimes metronidazole is another that is used. Unfortunately, sometimes up to 10% of patients don't respond well to those antibiotics, and you might have to give it a different antibiotic for a longer time. Um, and really, you know, there's a whole spectrum of this among the patients that you find in immunocompromised settings like like the AIDS patients or those types of patients where you might have multiple relapses. And so sometimes with AIDS patients, um, they try to prevent these infections from ever happening by giving them um, different types of drugs so that they don't obtain a C. difficile infection. So that's controversial at times. But And then you may have even heard or seen in the news, Robert, and the public may have too, that one of the more widely studied and kind of interesting thing that's going on right now is that if, if everything else fails, there are now a procedure available that actually is a fecal transplantation. Right. So you get what's, you know, kind of a, a healthy, if you will, normal flora put back into you. And I'm not an expert on how that happens. Well, I've had plenty of guests on the show talking about Have that. Have you? Yeah. It's really interesting. I've read a lot about topic, it, but yeah. I haven't witnessed, you know, the actual procedure. But it certainly seems to be working mm-hmm. uh, and, and, and transforming people's lives. Because if you get this thing um, and it keeps reoccurring, it can just devastate your, your living ability. Well, in something that's, you know, like my mother has always been interested in. She goes, well, you get C. diff from taking antibiotics, and then you're supposed to treat C. diff with a different antibiotic. It's just crazy, right? Yeah, it's It's crazy. uh, That's a great question. I mean, it kind of shows you how the general public sometimes can can ask a really good question. Yeah. Um, Okay, well, let's uh, get away from C. diff for a little bit here. And uh, I saw this pretty interesting article um, NBC News article, uh, Maggie Fox, right. who's one of my favorite writers, and um, she discussed something in your your neck of the woods, um, a very drug-resistant Klebsiella pneumonia, uh, some infections they've been seeing in Houston. And, right. Um, there's a, and there's a number of these organisms uh, that are causing some havoc in hospitals and with patients that are resistant to multiple antibiotics, you know, so we got the Klebsiella pneumonia, Acinetobacter, some of the ones you've mentioned, Enterobacter, right. and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Um, what's the backstory behind the emergence of these types of infections? Sure. First of all, let me, let me uh, mention, I follow Maggie too on, on a variety of social media. She's a wonderful uh, writer of, of a lot of health stories. So I, I did spend some time with that story and, and it kind of dates back even prior to that. You might remember back in January when we had the um, the lady from, I think she ultimately, had, she'd went to India and came back in Nevada, yeah. and she died uh, from a very similar organism. So we are seeing some of these now that, that literally are not being treatable, uh, at least with what's happening with these particular organisms. So this this particular story in the Houston study, it's the Methodist Hospital System. They did a study between 2011 and 2015. It's a a 2,000 bed uh, facility, and they found uh, 
um, about 15 different Klebsiella strains that, and this, this is a mouthful, but it's expressing something called the new Delhi metallo beta lactamase 1, uh, NDM1. And what all that means is that it, it contains a particular resistance enzyme that confers broad resistance against basically all beta lactam antibiotics. And so that's a, that's a big problem. Mm-hmm. Um, and we call those sometimes extended spectrum. So they are just really problematic. And we're seeing more and more of these strains kind of popping up. Um, the backstory really is that, and I like, this is how I explain it sometimes to introductory students, is if you think about a bacterium of this type that has these dangerous enzymes that I just mentioned, bacteria can do something called conjugation. And conjugation for the public is a way for the bacteria to use an appendage. It's called a pili. So think of a finger, and it kind of reaches out, and it can touch a completely separate and different bacteria. So it'd be like me touching you, Robert, mm-hmm. with my with my pili. And, and if I could just immediately and horizontally transfer to you my gray hair, and boom, you have it immediately. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to go through the normal uh, resistance buildup of just kind of of genetic selection that might take generations for that to occur. It's just immediate and upon touch. And so when you think about these organisms over time that have the ability to co-mingle and to pick up these resistance genes in a very rapid horizontal way, that's really worrious, worrisome to infectious disease experts because it almost it's just almost unfair, you know, that they can re, can just kind of become resistance that quick. Hmm. Another organism that uh, is pretty troublesome um, in the healthcare environment is vancomycin-resistant enterococci, or VRE. Um, what's the situation with the VRE in the healthcare set, uh, setting? VRE, or um, it actually stands for vancomycin-resistant enterococci. So, again, try not to get too deep into this into the bacteriology here, but enterococci is a is a group of bacteria that live in our guts and our intestines, sometimes on our skin. And they usually don't cause many problems, but they can become resistant to antibiotics. And what I just talked about earlier, that that conjugation event, is actually what happens. They have picked up this particular resistance uh, from other organisms that carry it, and then it takes over in people that are very ill or weak. So some in common sites for this infection in the healthcare setting are the intestinal tract, the urinary tract, wounds. But the one I read about all the time, and I think most people uh, that are at least seeing some of this issue, uh, can be from um, ventilator-associated pneumonia. So it can be transmitted um, not straight through the air like a common cold or flu virus, but certainly if you have pneumonia or you're coughing or you're on one of these ventilators, that can become problematic. If you're healthy and you're not one of these these risk factors I just mentioned, it's actually pretty low uh, uh-huh. as far as the chances of you getting VRE. But it's, you know, like a lot of these, if you're in a hospital setting and you have a weak immune system, you tend to have problems with these types of, of bugs. Okay. Um, let me uh, switch to the topic of antibiotic stewardship. Um, how are we doing as a nation at this? Well, I think we're getting better. Okay, good. <laughs> let me let me mention to the public, um, and and many people may know what this is just from the the standpoint of the word being a good steward of money or so forth. Mm-hmm. But basically, stewardship is in the United States is a kind of a coordinated program that's trying to promote you know appropriate use of antimicrobials, which includes antibiotics. You're trying to improve all patient outcomes, and and when you talk about this specific type, you're obviously talking about decreasing the spread of infections by multiply drug-resistant organisms. So we're doing better um, with respect to education and other vehicles. Mm -hmm. But really, in my professional opinion, you know, we're we're far from being close to being done. Um, Because antibiotics, while they've transformed medicine 
and and helped us live longer and healthier lives. We also now know that really 20 to 50 percent of all antibiotics prescribed, for instance, in healthcare settings, especially acute care settings, they're really unnecessary and inappropriate. So that's a that's a big problem for me because I think sometimes we don't spend enough time on educating the patient as long as we should, uh, even in the family practice setting, kind of thinking about making sure we laboratory confirm some of the types of things we're, we're maybe unnecessarily giving drugs for, like a common cold or an allergy or things like that. So in my opinion, we're a long ways away uh, from where we need to be. However, we are doing better. Um, we are basically in almost all areas of those types of infections I mentioned earlier, about a 50% reduction in, in clab seeds, which are blood stream infections. We've seen a 17% reduction in surgical site infections. These are all around 2008. Since then, the, um, the urinary tract, that's the only one that has not changed, so we're not doing well there. C. diff is down 8%. Uh, MRSA bloodstream infections are down 13%. So I think we're doing better. You know, we're getting the word out. You're obviously seeing it in the common press and the media and social media, so that helps. But we still have a long way to go. Okay. Um, I want to get this question. We've got about less than three minutes left. Um, so all this information that we've gone over over the past 45, 50 minutes um, – may be frightening to some of the listeners. It can be. So, sure. Dr. Rohde, in in a minute or two, what what can you do as a patient to protect yourself from HAIs? And are there, like, specific questions you can be asking while you're at the hospital? It's, it's a great question, Robert, and I appreciate you kind of ending on this because it's always my concern. You know, we don't want to scare people to death. Healthcare is... Uh, our friends, all of my colleagues working it, we're there to help, and we're trying to do our best to, to get you better. And and really in this realm, what I'm going to say, I think, and you, you know I say this a lot, is education and health literacy, I think, in my opinion anyway, are critical more and more every day for the general public to understand. So if you're out there listening and some of this has been kind of drinking by fire hose and maybe a little confusing, I would tell you to start reading uh, and watching and checking in on social media because scientific literature can be difficult. So people like me and my colleagues that are experts are doing better at trying to relay this information to the general public. But you need to understand the dangers of HAIs uh, and really more broadly and globally just antibiotic resistance in general. We all have a part in that. Questions and things to think about if you're out there is – and this is what I tell my parents, since you talked about your mom. I tell my dad, who's 75 and dealing with sometimes some issues from borderline diabetes and other stuff, do not be afraid to ask anyone in the healthcare facility about their HAI rates. We now in the United States, most of the states now have to report those to the public so you can find out how well your healthcare facility is doing. And talk to your physician. And those other health care providers, like a physician's assistant, for instance, or a, a nurse practitioner, or, or just anyone that can help you understand this better. And if nothing else, it's going to let them know that you understand what an HAI is and that an invasive medical procedure is still dangerous at times. It's, it's not, there is no such thing as minor surgery <laughs> anymore. So... In this world of antibiotic resistance, you really have to be on top of this. Well, great advice. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Rodney Rohde, for your time and expertise once again, and I appreciate you coming on the show uh, as a returning guest. It's always my pleasure, Robert. I, I love coming on and trying to help educate the public about anything and everything microbial. <laughs> Very good. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it. You bet. All right. Again, check out the website, OutbreakNewsToday.com, OutbreakNewsToday.com. I want to thank my guest, Dr. Rodney Rohde, and I will see you next week on Outbreak News This Week. Good night. God bless. Thank you for listening to Outbreak News This Week with Robert Harriman. If you missed any part of today's program, you can listen to the podcast anytime on our website, OutbreakNewsToday.com.
Make sure to join us here next week for Outbreak News This Week with Robert Harriman. 